first of all, I would like to thank you for joining me today. I highly appreciate it and I'm super excited. Are you ready to wrap your imperative mind around functional programming? I hope you do. My name is May. I am a software engineer and I'm a backend developer at AppSplyer. And yeah, I'm a sworn Star Wars fan, as you can see. <laughs> Let's talk about functional programming. In computer science, functional programming is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. That is taken from Wikipedia. And that's it. That's all for today. Thank you so much for being here. Bye. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, that's not how we're going to talk about functional programming at all. But what we are going to do is I am going to show you some code examples that are taken from this game that I developed uh, and is written in Clojure. I mean, the back end of this game is written in Clojure, which is a functional programming language. And the front end was written in React.js and it was developed by a talented developer and his name is Roy Berkowitz. So thank you, Roy for developing the great front end. So this is the game. What you can see over here, it's a modified version of the game. What you can see over here is players that are moving in four directions and they cannot leave the screen. So let's talk about functional programming and I will show you the code examples that describe how you can add a new player and how you can move a player and doing all of that in a functional programming way. What does it mean? It means that you will not have any objects and you will not use any for loops. You will just use what a functional programming language gives you. Let's see what is that exactly. So first things first, like I said, no objects, but what do we have? Well, we have key value map uh, instead. So. Let's take a look at the first code example. What we have over here is a function. The name of the function is new player. And what you can see is that the first key in this map is named player question mark. This implies that this is a Boolean uh, key, key, pair, uh, key value pair. And it means that this is a map that describes a player. All of the rest of the key, uh, all of the rest of the keys describe the other entities of this player. Since this is a multiplayer online game, if we have a lot of players, then we will have a collection that has all maps of all players. Next thing, we are going to have now pure functions. How do we do that? I mean, first of all, before how, what does it even mean? So. A function is considered pure if it returns the same result if given the same arguments and it does not cause any observable side effects. Okay, take a look at this function, for example. When you look at this function, you immediately know that if you send the same R, you will get the same result. And this is because the output of this function is dependent solely on the input and not on anything else. Also, it does not cause any observable side effects. And what does this exactly mean? So first thing, if you are reading from a file, for example, this means that you are dependent on something that is not the input of the function. It means that the content of the file can change, and then the output of the function will be different, even if I'll send the, if I'll, even if I'll send the same input. Another thing, another example is random number generation. Let's say that I have a function that is just x at times a random number, right? So even if I send the same x, I will get a different result because the result is dependent on random number generation. And last, if I modify a global object or a parameter passed by reference, this is causing observable, observable side effects. Another thing is like changing uh, a file, like writing to a file. That's also an observable side effect. So let's see an example of pure functions right here in our game. So the first function that we're going to look at is move player. So what move player is, 
doing is just getting an input, calculating the steps of the, the player and returning a player as an output. But how is that done exactly and why this function is considered pure? So over here we have four parameters that we're getting as an input. The first one is the player player's map, just like we saw before. It contains the X, the Y, and all sort of other data, but we're only going to use the X and the Y here of this uh, player's map. Another thing that this function is getting is move X and move Y. These describe the amount of steps that the player has taken. And then we also get the window width and the window's height. And so this is so we can check for collisions with the window. So the player will not be able to leave the window uh, of the game. So once we got this input, then what we're doing is calculating the new X and the new Y. And we're doing that by extracting the X and the Y from the player's map and we're adding the amount of steps that the player took and we're inserting it into new variables x and y. This brings me to the next topic, immutability. Well, we got x and y and we got the player and we wanted to change the, the, you know, the position of the player, but how are we going to do that? Are we going to change the player's map, the map that we received? Are we going to change that? Not quite. Let's see what we are going to do. So, immutability. When data is immutable, its state cannot change after it's created. If you want to change an immutable object, well, you just can't. Instead, what you do is create a new object with the new value. And that's exactly how we're going to handle the player entity. What does it mean? So like I said, we calculated the new X and the new Y, and now what we want to do is to return a new map of a player. It means that we're not changing the input. We are just returning a new player's map. That's the output. So over here, where in the yellow markup, you can see that I am checking inside the if function. I'm checking to see whether the X and the Y are valid if they're not smaller than zero. And, I, I, and then I also check to see whether the X and the Y are bigger than the window height and width. And if any of these happened, then I return a new player's map with a new uh, key and value pair, which is collision set to true. And I am using the associ function. The associ function returns a new map with the player uh, input values and a new key value pair. And if there was no collision with the window or the X and the Y are valid, then all we need to do is use associs once again to return a new player's map with new values set for x and y. So remember, I am not changing the input, I am just returning a new map. So let's move forward to the next part of the game. This is a bit more elevated version of the game that we just saw before. Over here you can see that the player can move in four directions and he can also collect uh, the exceptions that are sc scattered around the screen. And the thing about collecting the exception is that we need to make sure that it's the same type of exception that the player has above its head as the exception that was collected. If the player collected the exception that matches the one that is written above his head, then we want this exception to disappear from the screen. Remember that because that, that's going to be in our co code examples. So how are we going to talk about that? Well, we are going to talk about uh, functions as first class citizens. What does it mean? Okay, before I'm gonna show you the code examples, what does it mean that functions are first class citizens in functional programming languages? Well, in functional programming, functions are first class citizens. This means that functions can be treated as values. They can be assigned as values, passed into functions, and returned from functions. 
Let's hold on to this part of assigning functions as values. So let's take a look at a code example that shows us the part where we check for a collision with the exception, right? Because it's a collectible and then removing the exception from the screen. And the way that we're going to do that is if there was a collision, it means that if the X of the X and the Y of the player is the same as the X and the Y of the exception that was on the screen, right? Then we want to remove the exception from the exceptions list. I have uh, an entire list of exceptions and if one was collected, then I want to remove it from the list of exceptions because I don't want it to be shown on the screen anymore. Okay, let's begin. What you see over here is the collect function. And inside the collect function, what you can see that is marked in yellow, it's fn. This means that I'm declaring a new function. I'm creating a new function. And inside this new function, I am checking to see whether the exception type of the player matches the exception type that was on the screen. What I also do is I use uh, another function that is called overlap. That's in order to see whether the X and the Y of the exception and the player overlap each other. And this is how I detect the collision. What I'm going to do with this function that I just created, I am going to insert it into a variable named pred. And I do that using the led function. So I take a function, I declare it, and I insert it into a variable. That's crazy, isn't it? I mean, I think it's crazy. And this is the collect function. What is the next part? The next part that we want to do is to actually remove the exception from the screen in case there was a collision. So this, that brings me to uh, my next point, passing a function into other functions, okay, as an input. How do I do that? Well, over here you can see collectibles. This represents the collection of all the exceptions that are scattered around the screen. What, do also, what we have also is PRED. If you remember, PRED is the function that we just declared in the line above, right? And we're taking both the collection and the function that I created and I am sending it into the filter function. What I'm going to do with it, I'll explain in a second, but just notice this important fact that I created a function and I am sending it as an input to another function. And that's because functions are first class citizens in a functional programming language. Okay, next up we have higher order functions. What does it mean? A higher order function is a function that either takes one or more functions as an argument or returns a function as its result. And if I want to be, you know, more clear or to make it simple, I'll just say this because it's not very common to use for loops or any loops at all in, in uh, functional programming languages. I mean, you can do that, but I mean, it's not the idea, right? What we do have is functions acting on collections, okay? So then what I can do, I can use filter to go over all of the items that I have in a collection. Therefore, I don't need a loop anymore because I have something that is already doing what it is that I need to do on all of the items that are inside a certain collection. And this is how we don't need loops. Clever, huh? So that's it. We have not used objects. We talked about pure functions. We talked about immutability. We talked about functions as values and higher order functions. And that's it. What I want you to take from this is remember, in functional programming, we have functions acting on data and not data activating functions on itself. That's very important for you to remember that. And with that, I'm going to finish. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed my talk. If you have any questions, feel free to reach.